Welcome, everyone, to Columbus Reexplored, a reexamination of Christopher Columbus, his passions, motivations, and actions, a part of the Knights of Columbus First Understand webinar series. I'm your host, Donald Patty. So, as a Grand Knight for Our Lady of Fatima Council, I'm actually honored uh, to be joined not only by a renowned scholar, but also an accomplished author tonight. Um, to begin, her academic accomplishments are hard to match. Um, she has a bachelor's degree in philosophy from Boston University, um, followed by a master's from Harvard Divinity School and a PhD from the University of Chicago. She began her career conducting anthropological field work in Turkey, um, where she published her first book called The Seed and the Soil, Gender and Cosmology in Turkish Village Society, based on her Galler Prize winning dissertation that she wrote. Not resting on her laurels, she spent a year serving as a Fulbright Fellow in Belgium studying immigrant Turks, and then returned to Harvard to serve as Assistant Director for the Study of World Religions, where she taught several courses for the Divinity Schools. Um, next, in 1987, she joined the faculty of Stanford University and spent the next 20 years both researching and lecturing. Her course in investigating culture gave rise to the well-received textbook, Investigating Culture and Experimental Introduction to Anthropology. She also wrote Abraham on Trial, The Social Legacy of Biblical Myth, and was a finalist uh, for the National Jewish Book Award. That book also inspired Andrew Lovett's opera, Abraham on Trial, which debuted in 2005. It was actually during that time at Stanford that she began to read her research into Christopher Columbus, the European explorer who established the run of European presence in the Americas from the 1490s all the way up until today. Inspired by the subject, she retired from Stanford to research Columbus, culminating in the book Columbus and the Quest for Jerusalem. It was called one of the 100 best books of the year by um, the New York Times. And that book is why she is here with us today, helping us to uncover Christopher Columbus and helping us to re-explore Christopher Columbus. Finally, showing that she is still fleet of feet, she walked the Camino del Santiago from the <laughs> French border all the way to Spain's Atlantic coast in 2015, much like a number of our Knights of Columbus members have as well. And with that, I'd like to give you Dr. Carol Delaney, Professor Emeritus at Stanford University, the renowned scholar and anthropologist. Carol, thank you for joining us. Thank you, delighted to okay. be here. But I have two corrections. Sure. The, book, the book was um, the London Times, not the New York oh, Times. You are correct, my apologies. It was the and London Times. I hiked Times. the Camino three times. Ah, so she's well ahead of many. I was well trying many. to go back in the fall, but we couldn't because of the COVID. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> All right. Well, well why don't we go ahead and get started. Okay. So we wanted to learn more about uh, Christopher Columbus in particular and what his motivations and his actions were. So let's start with the historical context, which uh, we're going to start in Jerusalem. So what was going on in Europe and the Middle East prior to the time of Columbus? That, that I'm not really quite sure about, but his whole motive was to, as I've written in the book, to uh, fund a crusade to take Jerusalem back from the Muslims because first of all, Constantinople had been um, captured by the Muslims. There were lots of Genoese there. So they were no longer able to make the pilgrimage to Jerusalem, nor were they able to go across, you know, to trade like Marco Polo. And so Columbus was, you know, affected by that. And he also very much, um, was disturbed that Jerusalem was in Muslim hands. Ah, okay, very good. And so um, <laughs> most of us know um, why Jerusalem was important and that it was um, the Holy Land um, because of the role Christ played. Um, but there were a few reasons why it was important to Columbus. Yes. Um, yeah, can you tell me a little bit more yeah. about how this played into his motivation? Well, I think he, he thought the end of the world was coming. He figured out twice how many years were left, and it was imminent, and so he thought he really had to do something to try and get Jerusalem back in Christian hands so that Christ could come again, uh, the sepulcher could be rebuilt, 
and all the baptized people could be saved. And I have to say that he was always concerned about baptizing the natives so that they too would be saved. Ah, people, very good. People, people yeah. don't know that. Okay. And so you mentioned Holy Sepulchre, um, the church in Jerusalem. So he right. had a desire to have that rebuilt and that played into um, the apocalypse as well. Right. And it, it's in his agreements with Queen Isabella that the prophets, well, first of all, people know that he was planning to go to meet the Grand Khan to set up a trading post like Marco Polo had done, but he was going to go by the Western route because the Eastern route had been uh, given to the Portuguese. So he couldn't go that way. And the whole, but he also said in his agreements, the profits from this enterprise were to be used to finance the crusade, to take Jerusalem back from the Muslims. Mm, it's in his okay. writings. People just don't yeah. look at his writings. <laughs> yeah, and you mentioned the, the Muslims. And so, um, are you familiar with how long um, the Muslims and Christians were battling over control for Spain? Hmm. So I think it was at least um, 700 years. Wow. Yeah, it was actually quite a long time. So it extended all the way back to um, the end of the uh, 7th century, if my numbers are correct. Hmm. So he was born in 1451, correct? Around then, yeah. Okay, and he first approached Queen Isabella and asked back in, I believe it was 1485, if she would fund, um, so it was about uh, seven years from when he asked when he finally received a yes. Well, he first asked the Portuguese and they said no. Okay. So All I don't right. know what, what year that, I can't remember what year it was, he asked the Portuguese first. They said no, so then he went to Isabella. Yeah, so I think that was 1484. So he went to Isabella. Um, along the way, he also asked um, France and England through his brother. Um, and then if I'm correct, uh, Genoa as well. So there were actually five different, um, I could say groups, but uh, um, five different countries or city states that he did approach. Um, you mentioned that he went to Isabella and um, that was about 1485. So why was there such a long gap from 1485 to 1492? What happened leading into that? You know, Isabella said she'd wait, you know, think about it. And he waited around, um, spent some time at the monastery of La Rabida, which I've written about and I've been there. Um, and the, then he went back again and they finally decided, okay. All right, and I think it was about that point in time that um, the uh, Spaniards had their victory over the Moors at Granada. And so the, the Reconquista had come to a close at that point. So um, I think you had written that that was one of the key events that allowed Columbus's explorations to proceed. Yeah, I think that's right. Think that's uh, very right. good, very good. So um, uh, I, did not talk about this or touch upon this yet, but I'm curious a little bit about um, how you went about researching this um, subject, Colum Columbus and the quest for Jerusalem. What approach did you take? Well, first of all, I knew nothing about him like most people, except in 1492, he sailed the ocean blue. Uh -huh. And then I, I think I wrote in the book, I came across this mention somewhere in my research that um, about his uh, apocalyptic views and the millennium coming. And I thought, oh my God, because I've been interested in religion. And so that really affected me. And so I started to look into um, some of that material. And then someone said, oh, you should go to the John Carter Brown Library in Providence, which has a lot of material about what they call it, the encounter between the old world and the new. And so I spent the summer there reading everything I could about Columbus. And it was so fascinating. I decided to retire from Stanford then and move to Providence. And so that began the research. And so then I went to Genoa. I've been to his house. I've been um, to all the various museums that have things about him. I've held one of his documents in my hands. People don't hmm. know that he wrote a lot 
and some of it still remains. It's incredible. And um, so I went there and then I even did a, I had figured I had to figure out what it was like to go on a small sailing ship. Mm -hmm. So I spent a week on a sailing ship, <laughs> sort of like so it. it's a very small one. Something similar to a caravel. Yeah, right, yeah. exactly. Okay. And that was quite an experience. Um, did you anyway. swab the decks? I mean, we're all curious. Now oh, that yeah. you've led us down this, yeah? Oh, yeah, yeah. They, we they swabbed swab the, decks, the decks. We raised the sails. We You we, ate hardtack. <laughs> and we slept in these tiny little places. Not, uh, on the, not on the deck like many of the people in Columbus's on his trips, but it was pretty close. Anyway, and it wasn't, of course, across the ocean. I mean, it's amazing. I think that's one of the main things that he discovered, uh, that he found the route across the ocean. Nobody had ever tried it. And of course, he thought he was going to China. And nobody knew about the great, con you know, the American continents in the way. And he didn't realize that. He always thought he was on the periphery of China. Mm. Yeah. But he did discover the route. And every single trip, it's just amazing. He followed the same route and he always made it back and forth. It's pretty extraordinary, really. Yeah, I could say one of the things that I really picked up from reading your book in particular was what an outstanding navigator he was and what an outstanding sailor he was. Um, there were a number of storms that he encountered where people were almost certain that, that he and his ships would have uh, sunk right, and right. they did not. And there were times where they ran aground where they were able to recover. And it was just amazing to hear how well he was able to deal with all of the challenges that people um, would normally uh, result in people perishing at sea. Right. Um, one more question about you before I move on. So you're an anthropologist. So how do you think this changed your approach to the subject? Well, first of all, anthropologists have to get into the time period of, or, and the place where they're studying. I mean, I did my field work in Turkey. I knew nothing about Turkey. So I had to learn a lot about Islam and about Turkish culture and so forth um, before you do that. So with Columbus, I had to read a lot about, you know, 15th century Europe and all that kind of stuff, and which I did to try and get into the worldview and what he was thinking about and what he was expecting. Okay. All right. So um, back to Columbus. So let's talk a little pre-voyage some more and his quest for funding. So we mentioned that he went um, and approached five different countries, actually four countries, one city state. Um, we talked a little bit about his route west versus his route east. Let's start with his father. So his father was not a sailor. How did Columbus end up becoming a sailor? <laughs> That's very interesting. I'm not sure. His father was the gatekeeper in Genoa. And some people think that he was not born in Genoa, blah, blah, blah. He may have been born in a village outside of it, but if his father was the gatekeeper, a position given only to very respected uh, residents, it's clear that he was a, a resident of Genoa, an Italian. And their house is still there, preserved as a museum. Oh. So, you know, I went there and looked around and so forth. Remind me the rest of your question. Oh, no, uh, my, my follow-up was just, um, do we have any idea of how Columbus ended up becoming a sailor when his father was um, a gatekeeper and actually in a very important post, but not in the, uh, in the, right. the world of... of I, think it was I think it was because of the um, takeover of Constantinople where there were lots of Genoese. And people were very upset about that. And he could not go sailing the other way because the Pope had given the Eastern route to the Portuguese. I mean, he did go there to, to try and ask them, but they said no. And that's why he went to the, to the Spaniards. To yeah, and in fact, you mentioned the why go west. And so mm -hmm. um, he headed east by going west. Um, there was um, something that uh, gave the Portuguese, I'll use the term, ownership of the rights to head <laughs> east. Tell us more. So Constantinople had fallen to the Turks, which right. meant overland routes were 
essentially blocked off without right. going right. through um, the Ottoman Empire. Um, then um, the Portuguese had control over uh, water routes. Tell me more about that. What, what, what drove that? Well, it was the Pope who divided, who, who gave the Portuguese the routes to the east, the ocean routes to the east. And then he gave the other ones the, the going west to the Spaniards. He drew a line down the Atlantic. I mean, what gave the Pope this right? I, I don't get it. But anyway, it said that the Pope drew the line down the Atlantic so the Portuguese could go east, the Spaniards had to go west. So that's why uh, Columbus had to go west. That was not his original idea. His original idea was to go east the way other people had gone. <laughs> and the right. people knew that the world was round. Uh -huh. People worry about that. They think, oh, nobody knew the world. Everybody knew the world was round. Nobody knew about the Atlantic continents in the way. So he thought, okay, I'll just go west and I'll hit China. All right, very good. So um, let's start with his first voyage. So um, how did he end up choosing his crew? I have no idea. I really don't have, I don't have, right. well, that's something I have not I, researched. I have, your, I have your book to my right. <laughs> oh, and, uh, maybe I have it, it tells. In my mind. So um, uh, if you uh, remember, you had written that, uh, the crew and the ships came from Palos. Does that sound familiar? Well, that's and, where they uh, left from. That's where they left from. Yeah, and apparently they were pay repaying a debt to the queen. So the queen, rather than find him entirely new ships, wrote a letter to the city and said, time to pay your debt. Uh, I need two ships, or I'm sorry, I need, a, I think it was yeah. two ships or three ships for a year. And, um, you know, here uh, you're repaying the debt to the queen. Um, so, uh, related to that, so these were, these were Spaniards, they were from Palos, um, they included, uh, Martin, um, Alonso Pinzon, Alonso, yeah. um, how, how loyal were they to Columbus? Um, first of all, I, I wish I would reread my book before this, but it's been, you know, 15 years while I did all oh, the research right. and I haven't reread it, so I'm really sorry to your listeners that, that I can't remember, but you're absolutely right. I mean, they did leave from Palos, and I've been there. That's right below the monastery of La Rabida, which is a Franciscan monastery. And as I've said in my book, Columbus was very, very um, related to all the Franciscans. He eventually became a Franciscan, a lay Franciscan monk. But anyway, so I've been to La Rabida. They have all this stuff about Columbus. And I walked down to Palos where the ships you know, departed, and they still have a replica there of one of them. So anybody who's interested in seeing it, they, they can go there. Um, yeah, they left from Palos. I don't know how he recruited the people at all. I, I can't remember. All right, very good. Hold on just a moment. Yes, Casey? All right. What's the first question? All right, the first question we have for you, sorry I didn't notice these earlier, but did Columbus visit Ireland to read about St. Brendan the Navigator is the first question. Did Columbus visit Ireland? That is the question, and it was about St. Brendan the Navigator. Brendan the Navigator. I have no idea about Brendan, but I think on his way to England, because he did go to England, I think he did stop in Ireland. Yep, um, he was actually in Galway. and. Yeah. There was talk that he had gone on to Iceland, although I don't know that that was 100% confirmed. So um, there was a second part to that, Casey, that was specifically about meeting a saint. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, Saint Bren not to read about Saint Brendan the Navigator. Oh, that I'm not familiar with myself. Yeah, I'm not either. I'm looking up in my book if I can see anything about Brendan. <laughs> but there was definitely an impact by visiting. Yeah, right. There we go. Um, there was definitely was an impact by him visiting uh, Ireland and England. And um, what was interesting about it was he discovered even more about the trade winds and right. how the right. trade winds operated by making right. trade. Right. Right. Absolutely. So. Back to the first voyage. Okay. Okay. 
Um, let's we'll continue on and then we'll we'll pick up some of the questions, okay? <laughs> um, so uh, let's see. Um, so we talked about um, the crew. They are Spaniards. They're from Palos, and they're loyal to themselves and loyal to Spain, but not necessarily loyal to Columbus. Um, so uh, he actually had two captains who were from the same family of the ships, and he was on the third ship. Um, how many days did they end up traveling before first land site? About how long were they journeying? It was quite for? a long time. It's in my book, but if I don't really, you know, I should have reread the whole thing before I did this interview. I would think, you know, uh, at least three weeks, at least. Yeah, yeah, I seem to remember. And I think it's more than there. that. And I think I when they got to the middle. 40 days, yeah. Yeah, I thought it was around 40 days, but when they got to the middle, there was a lot of turmoil in, in some of the ocean, and a lot of the crew wanted to turn around at that point. And he said, no, we're going to continue on, which is amazing. And they went. And that route, you know, became the route that he traveled back and forth all the time. Amazing that he could, you know, sort of find it every single time. Yeah. And you mentioned that there was a lot of turbulence along the way. Yeah. So um, how close did they come to actually turning back? I seem to remember something about a promise that Columbus made to his crew. Well, I think I just mentioned that when they hit that turbulence in the middle of the ocean, there was a lot of crew members who said, we've got to turn back, we've got to turn back. And he just kept saying, no, just wait a little bit, we'll go on. And so they didn't turn back. Okay, very good. All right. Um, so they arrived and um, their first encounter was actually with um, a Native American group, the Tainos. Um, what did he think of them? What well, he always, he always thought he was on the periphery of China. So he didn't quite know who these people were, or, but he thought he was, you know, uh, and he kept looking to go to China. But the other thing is that people should know he became friends with them, especially Chief Guacanagari, if I'm pronouncing that right. And they remained friends throughout all the time. And um, he liked them. I mean, he thought they were really good people. And oh, he had yeah, no intentions of enslaving any of them. Yeah, you mentioned Guacanagari, and oh. I've seen that spelled a few different ways. So um, it certainly could be um, uh, pronounced a, a, a variety of different ways. Um, so what you're telling us is he didn't really look down upon them, um, no. that he actually uh, looked to them to become friends. So um, did he ever treat them cruelly during that first voyage? No, absolutely not, no. Okay. No. Mm -mm. And um, uh, during the first couple of days uh, in his ship's log, um, or rather in his diary, um, there was, there's some quotes that are often misinterpreted. Um, some say that he, um, claimed that they would make good slaves. Do you have a, a little bit better idea of what he actually said and what he was I referring? don't think he ever said they'd make good slaves. I think he said they might make good servants. It's a totally different thing because they were very sweet, very docile, and so forth. And then when he, you know, the Santa Maria went aground on that first voyage, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And so he had to leave 39 men there, leaving strict instructions do not go marauding, do not go raping, be friends with Guacanagari, you know, and so forth and so on. And of course they went against the rules, his orders. All right. So that was one of the challenges he faced as well was that um, it sounds like uh, the, the uh, uh, crew and the uh, captains that he was uh, sailing with, there were some more challenges there. Let's see. So um, getting back to the quest for um, Jerusalem, how did everything that Columbus and his men were discovering there, how did that uh, fit into Columbus's plan? So they, um, it, tell us a little bit more about that. Oh dear. Um, 
Well, I think eventually, you know, there was, he kept sailing, hoping to reach the Grand Khan. People sort of forget about that. It's not like he landed there and that's where everything was going to happen. And he, half of the time he's off sailing, still trying to find the Grand Khan. And that's mm -hmm. when, of course, a lot of the people did bad things when he was away. But then eventually they did establish, not on the first voyage, but later, they did discover gold. Mm. And so they did start mining for gold. And the, the prophet, he said the profits from that should be used to finance the crusade for Jerusalem. Okay, so it wasn't gold for gold's sake. Oh, it no. was more um, gold, essentially, for crusades yeah. and for Christianity. Right. Okay. And he talked to Isabella about that. It's in his agreements with Isabella. It's in the writings. All right, so... I've got another question, and this is also first voyage. So one of the people, things people often um, say is, well, that he took um, Native Americans captive and took them aboard his ship, and he was trying to enslave them. What was oh. going on there? Oh, that's totally ridiculous. It was that he, he did take six Natives back with him, and in his diary he said lots more wanted to go. All he had was a tiny little ship you know, trying to get a rescue ship. He went back to Spain to get a rescue ship to come back and get the men that had to be left behind. So he t did take six natives with him. He said more wanted to go. They got to Spain. They were all baptized. Baptized people could not be enslaved. One of them became his godson and traveled with him from, on his other voyages. Two of them remained at court. And lately I've been thinking, I would love to know what happened to those two who remained at court. They must have, you know, stayed in Spain, maybe married Spaniards, maybe there are relatives there today. It would be really interesting to know what happened to those two. And the other three wanted to go back home and one of them died at sea. So the other two, well, so Actually three of them, home. his godson and the other two, went back. Wow, what an amazing experience that must have been going all the way from the New World all the way to Spain and then all the way back to be able back to tell again. you your family yeah. and friends about it. Right, yeah. yeah. Okay, so you mentioned the Santa Maria and the fact that it ran aground. Um, the men aboard, did they perish? No, did those are the perish? ones, those are the ones who had to be left behind. Okay, and um, what day of the year was that? Oh, I don't, I'd have to look at my book. I don't know what day. Ah, yeah, La Navidad. And it was actually because it was Christmas Day. And um, initially they thought there was a lot of um, uh, bad fortune perhaps from it. And then um, Columbus actually believed that it was a sign from God because that was actually the first encounter they had with Wakanagari, um, as you mm -hmm. mentioned, the, the chieftain. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, in many ways, a chief of chiefs because of his uh, prominence there. All right, so he returned back to Spain after the initial explorations and left right. behind the 39 men that you mentioned, and they stayed in La Navidad, and they were right. told explicitly to treat the Indians well, um, and um, also told to help to collect gold while he went and found a ship. Well, I don't know if they, they might have been told to look for gold, but not to find, you know, it was later that they actually discovered gold on the island. But he also told them, you know, not to go marauding to other places. Ah, it's it's yeah. in his, it's, I've seen the instructions, they, they still survive. You know, treat Guacanagari with respect, do not go marauding, do not go raping. Of course, the men, assumed that they should all have a concubine. And that was a big deal. And so they, they did horrible things. All right. So um, let's talk a little bit about the second voyage. Mm. Um, so they're headed back to the Americas. The first time he went, he went with three ships. Um, the second, and about 85 men. About how many ships came on the second voyage was it, it was the same terrible amount? i think it was mm -hmm. terrible isabella sent 17 ships wow. and hun hundreds of men 
I think that was a terrible mistake because then they really sort of took over and did a lot of the horrible things when they got All there. Right. All right. And so that was one of the big shifts away from yeah. um, it being primarily um, uh, exploration and right. moving toward right. really having to take care of a colony. Um, yeah, and enough, establishing a colony, which was not Columbus's idea at all. Yeah, yeah. So the first settlement, La Navidad, was called a factoria. Why is that, or a factoria? Versus a colony or, or, an, or an hidalgo. I'm sorry, a, 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 a settlement. I think it was just meant to be a little settlement. And then it just got extended. And I think it was Isabella, you know, who decided, we, oh, this is a great place. We're going to just send a lot of people. All right. And 17 yeah. ships. That was crazy. Yeah, that's an it's enormous crazy. number of people. I'm crazy. sure the, uh, the locals were overwhelmed. Yeah. Um, oh. At that point, um, Columbus started facing some challenges with some of the settlers, the, um, the Adalgos in particular. So um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? About who? Um, the Adalgo. So that the, uh, we'll call them the um, more wealthy class that actually joined on the second um, voyage. Well, of course, they, they thought everything, you know, they should be able to get you know, the property, the gold, and, you know, establish a whole place. But that was never his intention. You know, he was still friends with Guacanagari, and that, that was his place. You know, and he was appalled, I think, by all these people and by Isabella and what she had done. That, that's all my right. sense. Okay. I don't really have, I don't, I can't say that I have evidence for that, but my sense after reading all this stuff was that he was pretty appalled by that. And then, you know, she sent over Bobadilla and Roldan, who were really awful, really awful. Yeah, yeah, so that gets us on to the, I think the third voyage, correct? I think it's the third. yeah. I yeah, think yeah. The um, oh. So we can, we can come back a little bit to the uh, um, second in a moment. So you mentioned that uh, for the third voyage, Columbus had even more problems on his hands, so. Um, early on in the second voyage, he had the Adalgos, the more wealthy um, Spaniards, who really didn't want to work. They were looking for right. people to take care of them now that they were there. They didn't right. adapt to the customs and to the, to the culture and to the food that was available. So they were um, draining resources. Um, what happened in the third voyage with um, World End? Well, first of all, in the second one, the, those guys who were there, seemed to think they could just take over the whole country. It wasn't theirs, you know? And I think it was very disturbing for Columbus. And in the third voyage, oh God, Roldan was sent over to sort of take control. Because again, Columbus is still off trying to find the Grand Khan a lot of the time, but Roldan, and I, you know, I wish I had read my, reread my book before this interview, but mm -hmm. Roldan in my memory was, really bad. I mean, he just, again, like the settlers thought, oh, we're, we're just gonna take over this land and it's ours. Yeah, and in fact- And he, and, um, he is one of the people who enslaved people. Actually, that's what I was gonna say. So yeah. that was one of the earliest times or the yeah. first times that we heard slavery mentioned yeah. Yeah. in the yeah. context of Columbus. Right. And so um, Roldan, according to your book, started a rebellion and um, that rebellion included taking of slaves and yeah. quite a bit of violence toward the, yeah. native, the natives yeah. who were on the island. Right, absolutely. Yeah, Roldan, Roldan started all of that. And I can't remember exactly from my book when, um, what to do with all these people that he'd rounded up. And yes, some of them were sent back to Spain as slaves, mm -hmm. but that's not what Columbus had wanted to do. These were the people that Roldan had, you know, rounded up. And what could he do with them? Yeah. And they were on mention, the ships already. <laughs> yeah. And you did mention as well that um, the, um, the Tainos, of course, were um, the first group that uh, Columbus encountered. But there were also the Caribs. Yeah. And they yeah. were called the Cannibales. 
as well. Well, um, I, I, I remember hearing about them as the Caribs. Mm -hmm. The Caribs. And they were a group against the Tainos. And sometimes they um, had kidnapped people from Guacanagari's group. And at least once, Columbus went and rescued those people and brought them back. Um, and he, I think they fought a little bit against the, the Caribs, I sort of forget, but um, they were definitely enemies of the people that Columbus was friendly with. Mm -hmm. Okay. There was another rebel amongst the group. Uh, I don't know if you remember um, Alonso de Ojeda. Ojeda was actually um, a rebel as well, but he tried to take over yeah. and Roldan yep. countered that and right. he ended up being um, captured himself. Right. Where did he end up? This is Ojeda. Um, you remember. I, I thought they were sent back to Spain, but I'm not sure. Yeah, so um, this actually plays into the arrival of Francisco de Bobadilla. What did Francisco <laughs> see when he arrived? I think he was pretty disturbed about what he saw. And he was another one who wanted to capture all these people as slaves. He was, he was awful too. And, and when he, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, when he first arrived, he saw Alonso de Hojeda and one of his other men hanging for the rebellion, for the uprising. Yeah, right. And right. that, when he saw Spaniards hanging, right. he kind of panicked. Right. Yeah, and Columbus had, had hung them to serve as an example, both to the natives, we will not allow this kind of behavior to go on, but also as an example to the Spaniards who were there. This behavior is not acceptable. Okay. I'm not now, sure it had the impact that he was hoping it would have, but. Well, evidently not. So what did Bobadilla do with Columbus? <laughs> He captured him when he was, after he arrived back from one of his explorations and put him in chains and put him on the next ship and sent him back to Spain. All right. So he not only robbed him of all of his authority, but he yep. actually put him in chains and sent him back to Spain and chains. And took, o he, and took over the, you know, the government of that place. And when right. Columbus got back to Spain, Isabella removed the chains immediately. All right. Very good. But Bobadilla, so I think, was a really on. terrible person. And apparently there's some book of his now that has recently come out. I haven't read it. Um, but I, from what I read from Columbus, who I feel was writing truthfully, and I, I you know, I, I, I accept what he wrote. But apparently Bobadilla was terrible. I mean, he enslaved a lot of people and sent them back on ships. And then he said Columbus too. And so at this point, this was between the third and fourth voyage. It right. sounds like things were pretty well out of control and yeah. out of Columbus's hands. Yeah, definitely. All right. And so that gets us to the fourth voyage, which was the last one for Columbus. This right. had a very different purpose than some of the other ones. Um, what was the purpose of the fourth voyage versus say the second and the third? Columbus was kind of reined in. I think he was still trying to find China. And on this one, later on, he continued all the way down through Panama and discovered that there was ocean on the other side. Somebody said that, but they were not about to walk across Panama to get there. And so then he also, um, I guess you could say discovered, I don't know that that's the right word, um, the north coast of South America but I'm not sure he realized it was a huge continent. And they sailed along it. Some of the sailors went on, on land, but I don't think Columbus did. But then they had so, to get back. Yeah, yeah. So you mentioned that they had discovered the north coast, north coast of South America. And um, at first, you're right. He labeled it an island. And I think it was Gallega. Does that sound right? Sounds right. Uh, okay. And what was interesting about it was there were um, there was an outflow of water yes. from one of the rivers that was so overwhelming that it almost sank their ships. 
And it was at that point that he realized that this could not just be another island, that there was so much water coming from right. the, the right. land that it was probably a continent. Yes, you're right. All right. So at the end of the fourth voyage, he made his final return to Spain. Um, how was his health at this point? And how old was he? Well, he must have been hmm, probably approaching 70. I don't know exactly. All right. Yeah. So he was getting up there in years. Yeah. And uh, how was his health overall? Because um, obviously, if he was born 1451, he was well into his 50s easily and perhaps in his 60s. So um, do you remember how his health was? No, I don't. I mean, I don't know that it was bad. I mean, I think he just remained in Spain. He did not go back to Italy. He remained in Spain. And um, did he die a pauper or a wealthy man? Uh, it was, I don't think he was a pauper. I think they made sure that he was well taken care of. But how rich, I have no idea. Maybe it's in the book. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> did you read yeah, it? <laughs> yeah, so, so fortunately, when he came back, when he was returned after the third voyage in chains, they gave him quite a bit of money then. And when he came back after the fourth voyage, so they owed him quite a bit of money. And so um, he received um, a, a recurring payments for a while to be able to um, build up a, an inheritance for his family. Hmm. Yeah. Now, um, the, let, let's go ahead and recap. So I said we would start, we talked a little bit of, or quite a bit about Columbus and um, that we would um, sort of answer the questions good and bad. So great explorer, yes or no? Oh, absolutely, yes. Uh, all right, okay. Um, great sailor, great sailor, unbelievable. Great sailor, yeah, okay. How about the entrepreneurial side, the, the years he spent persuading people and bringing the investments in? I think pretty good. Yeah, okay. I would say pretty good. How about in terms of visionary? I think that was his whole purpose was a visionary, you know, to get the money to fund the crusade. That was still in back of his mind right till the end. Fund the crusade for Jerusalem. All right. Um, slave trader? Slaves were sent back. There's no question but he was pretty much against it. Okay. He had a hard um, time with uh, Bobadilla, Roldan and Bobadilla about sending slaves, but it's interesting that Columbus never had a slave. There's no mention of any slave. And yet Las Casas, who is thought now, he's written books about Columbus, who is thought now to be the defender of the Indians. He had slaves. He had two encomiendas, which are large ranches, run by slaves. Columbus wow. never had a slave. He never, he had a godson. <laughs> Genocide or mass murderer. Oh, no. Columbus was against any enslavement or killing. It was these people like Roldan and Bobadilla who did all that stuff against okay. his explicit orders. But he's one man against all these other guys. All right, very good. So just to recap, so kind to the natives. Yeah. He sought to make them Christians, which actually would have prevented them from being enslaved. Right. He, and he kept asking Isabella to send more priests over so they could be taught and baptized. And she never did. Mm -hmm. um, he never owned slaves himself. No, never. He actually adopted one of the natives as his godson. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, he attempted to restrain the Spaniards um, who were with him and who frequently disobeyed it, and in many cases, or in some cases, right, actually mutinied. Right. Yeah. And he was imprisoned for punishing the men who disobeyed his orders regarding the treatment of natives. I guess okay. he was, yeah. Yep. And he had a deep sense of faith. Um, he actually ended up becoming a Franciscan monk. Yes, he did. After the first voyage, he became a late Franciscan monk. And it said that he wore their robes for the rest of his life. And nobody knows that. And then lastly, he was more interested in recapturing Jerusalem for Christianity than he was in hoarding gold. I came across 
liking him very much. And I think he's been much maligned. Yeah, yeah. And I, I would have to agree with that. I started it um, being somewhat skeptical, having heard all of the uh, um, bad stories and bad tales about Columbus and all the things that he was accused of doing and found out that I really not only admired him as an explorer, but I actually um, grew to admire him as a human being and as a man of Christian faith, someone who with very strong faith. Yes, I totally agree. Well, thank you very much, Carol, for joining us. Um, just a thank reminder, you. everyone out there, um, Carol is the author of the book Columbus and the Quest for Jerusalem. Um, you can find it out there um, through Amazon and through other booksellers. We really appreciate you taking the time out today, um, uh, close to an hour with us, um, helping us out, uh, answer these uh, questions about Christopher Columbus and getting to know him better. And um, my thanks on behalf of um, our Knights of Columbus Council. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Good night. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. You've just seen the webinar, Columbus Reexplored, a reexamination of Christopher Columbus, his passions, motivations, and actions, a part of the Knights of Columbus First Understand webinar series. If you'd like to read Dr. Carol Delaney's book, you can find Columbus and the Quest for Jerusalem at Amazon Books and through your local bookseller.